So we're going to uh, have a conversation around some of the incredible urban innovation that you were doing and try to get some insights or lessons for investors and for entrepreneurs about this market. Uh, let me try start with you, Lukic. What brought you to uh, do Delivery Hero? And what kind of like research you've done to understand Delivery Hero is an emerging need for kind of like urban contemporary experience? So like, um, it had nothing to do with urban experience. <laughs> it had to do with uh, entrepreneurship. So basically like um, in, in Germany, like after the, after the internet bubble burst, there was very little entrepreneurship. Yeah? The, in, in Germany, the, the startup world has been mimicked with a few years delay compared to the US. When the bubble burst, it was instantaneous. And there was like a little bit, um, yeah, need to catch up with entrepreneurship. And Deliver here was one result of that. So like investing a lot in startups, being like a, a little bit of a pioneer here in the German scene. And then it was randomly, we found this business model. And it's a great business model. And then we simply scaled it, so. Could you share with us, Shmuel? You make a decision to invest in Delivery Hero and to believe that that's going to be a winner in the delivery market. How an investor make a decision in a rather commoditized market of delivery to decide to pick one company? What's kind of like the differentiators? So I think when, uh, when Delivery Hero was set up, it wasn't really a commoditized market yet. And it wasn't even a, it wasn't a particularly obvious market, right? It's uh, 2010, I guess. It was, uh, iPhone was getting started. People didn't have their credit cards on phones yet. So it wasn't, it definitely wasn't an obvious market when the initial investment was made. But um, when, when we as Target, uh, we were very fortunate to invest in, in delivery here from our previous fund from Hustle Platinum Ventures and then early on and then from Target uh, very early also. And um, I think when we had invested, it was already, you could see the numbers, you could see the trends going up. And as Lucas said, Europe is a little bit behind, I think, catching up, but a little bit behind uh, the U.S. So you could see how the U.S. market was evolving and sort of get to see how things here were going to look like a year, two years down the road. Well, but here's the question. You sit at the investment team and you understand it's a great entrepreneur and it's probably uh, early in the market. But what's the thought process you have about how it would have sustainable, unique differentiators, sustainable, unique advantage, given that it's not a lot of technology or something to patent, it's more about around execution. What's kind of like the thought process for investors here? So I think because it's a bit of an execution play, first of all, being relatively early, it was definitely not the first, it was definitely not the only, but it was, it was early, uh, having the strongest team, and particularly in this case, uh, I hate to do it when you're here, <laughs> to flatter you, it's awful, but the most fundable team, and the most creative team around M&A and around, cool. I mean, in the end, Delivery Hero made, I think, close to two dozen acquisitions before it went public. Very smart to go, and in places where they could not build something, buy something. So you see the most fundable team, the most aggressive team in a big market, and that's the bet you need to be making. Look, at when you go into such a business of execution, and certainly at the beginning, you need to spend a lot of money to build your operations rights and brands right. What's most important for you? Is it around uh, profit? Is it around scale? Is it around kind of like customer base? What's your thought process in growing your company? No, it should be fun, most, uh, most importantly. <clears throat> Every situation is different, yeah? So like, but, yeah, in, th in that case, large markets, small innovations, and like what Shmuel just said, like timing, t timing needs to be right. Uh, I talked about like the first internet bubble and how it burst and there was nothing. The, and, and delivery was but simply take out food delivery. And it's a great business model because if you acquire the customer once and then like, some of them stay for 10 years plus. Yeah? So it's great customer lifetime value, that's, uh, that's simply it. But when the, when the model was around the first time in the market, the consumers had no mobile phones yet, the restaurants had no computers, etc. So the, the first few have been too early. If you're too early and you have a lot of money, you might be doomed. Yeah? Because if then you start to spend this money and then you're, then, you're, then you're addicted to capital injections. And if the market is not there yet, you're going to fail. So like my fir the first business that I started was a t-shirt business, Spreadshirt, mm -hmm. www.spreadshirt.com. <laughs> can all the customized t-shirts online. 
Shmuel. And it's, it's, probably no, made in, it's probably made in sure. China, so you can't order them today. But <laughs> That's not true. Able. You can order them anytime. www.spreadshirt.com. <laughs> no, um, <laughs> the, the, the funny thing there was like, we, uh, I started this while still being a student at university. Yeah, 2000, 2001, just after the bubble burst. So no, no, no one would give me money. Yeah, like you could go to investors, they would say like, oh, we just read in the newspapers, uh, the internet is fraud and a scam. So, and you're a student, you're not committed. So we ended up not raising money. Yeah, and then uh, this, so you needed to bootstrap. Yeah, we needed to bootstrap. But like those who raised money, like have not been successful. Sure. And the one who has bootstrapped, then who have more runway, etc. So long way to say. Every situation is different. Sometimes it's bad to have a lot of money. Sometimes it's you need to. It's all about timing. Shmuel, what's your thought process as an investor? Uh, we know that when kind of like an industry picks up or kind of like a solution picks up, there'll be many other investors putting a lot of money into companies in order to enable them to accelerate operation. What's your thought process in investing in such companies that would require a lot of capital to, to grow? There's an assumption, there's a thought process. Yeah, exactly, I was gonna say, that's a very different, very, very dangerous assumption. Um, we're, I'm an early stage investor. I mostly invest in, in teams and markets. So obviously, first of all, products will oftentimes change. Second, if you think about when, when uh, Delivery Hero was set up, you think about the problems people are thinking about investing or not investing, a lot of them look really ridiculous today. For instance, the ability to pay online, pay on your mm. mobile phone. Will people put their credit card in an app? In 2010, that looked ridiculous. Today, it looks absolutely obvious. So a lot of those product questions are just not relevant when you invest early on. Mm. The question is, are you backing, first of all, the right market? So are you backing a market sure. that's starting, have already, has already started to evolve? And it's not, it's, you're not investing in Friendster. Sure. You're not investing prematurely. You're in the right time, in the right market. And for that, we try to go to just markets that are inherently very big, like sure. travel, food. Uh, everybody eats three times a day. Most of us uh, travel. One thing, the world is simple. In that case, yes. whoever is interested in that, it was super simple because if there was a public company in Denmark, okay, they have to mm. just eat. They've been public with the Danish business. And if you can make like four million EBIT on the population of Denmark, then do the math. If, if you can build a $150 million company on the Emirates, mm. you could uh, build... Uh... Now, now that that's leads to my next question. Uh, we tend to think about uh, digital innovation and the internet innovation as kind of like global. You set a software company and it can go global. In these market segments, it's about local operation. It's about kind of like adaption to the local market needs. How do you uh, create a company look at that's in every time needs to go to a different market with a different culture, different kind of like market conditions and grow these local operations. So you, <coughs> again, like every, every case is different in the case of something like Deliver here where there's like where the price is very big. Um, you, you, you do a decentralized approach. So if you start, if you go international to a, to, to a country abroad, you give the local team a lot of freedom, including product and tech resources. Or the alternative is you buy local competitors, you buy them, you buy them early, yeah, and uh, there usually if you buy, you don't integrate too much. You integrate only um, mainly finance at the beginning. Yeah? So, so you, don't, you don't integrate them. You keep the team. You buy out the investors. You keep the management team. That's how so, you buy companies. So here's a very interesting uh, follow-up question on that. Would then the product uh, market fit would be on a local basis? or will be kind of like a centralized decision? Yeah, so like the, <clears throat> the product market fit is on, on a local basis. Like, so a lot of like small changes add up to an order of magnitude in, in, in outcome difference. And because of you, it's local competition. If my customer acquisition costs are 20% lower than mm. the ones of my competitor because of my product That's is more cool. adapted, uh, and I'm 20% better in, in raising capital, for example, yeah, then it's already 40%, add another 20% in some other dimension, it's 60%, yeah? Sure. And then you end up with, I don't know, twice as good, but twice as good is not twice as good outcome, it's like 10x as good outcome. No, no, I have a I guess, question. I guess just one sure. thing about that, I think the products need to have global appeal. They can be locally sort of fidgeted with, but in the end, if the product is not globally appealing, and then food delivery is a good example, sure. it's globally appealing, or at least the concept that globally, it, 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 won't, it won't really become a big business. Sure. 
Now let's go for a second to focus about Berlin. You know, we decided to do the conference here as we understand that something special is happening in Berlin. You know, I was visiting a startup. Like to Super Eternal. <laughs> I, I, I visited a startup earlier in Berlin that I realized that the team is composed from there are only 20 people there, but 10 different nationalities. They all speak English, but at the end of the day, it was Germans and, uh, and uh, British and uh, Swedish, all coming together with different cultures and kind of like partnering with different skill sets and very creative culture. What makes Berlin now the hub of innovation and what are kind of like the tips for Israelis here that want to actually set the operations in Berlin? I think that's a question. Wait, where are you originally from? Remind me. I'm, I'm born in Poland, born but in Poland. I grew up in I a think, small city, Kassel. One of the interesting things about Berlin is that as an entrepreneurship, as, a, as an ecosystem, it started with a lot of immigrants. And it started with people that are not necessarily German. It, what, it's not a big German business city as a general rule. The big German corporates are not, have not been here. Uh, but it is a city where I think uh, a lot of young people want to live. So it was historically a cheaper place to live. It was a cheaper alternative to London for sort of a team from Poland, a team from Czech Republic, a team from Israel who wanted to do something uh, in Europe. And, and that is how the ecosystem started here. And now that it's a bit more expensive, a bit more evolved, it still is a big part of what this city is about. It's a hub for people coming together. So the hub for people coming together, it's excellent and we see it, but now it's a little bit about a question about the business terms of setting a business. One major consideration for many of the companies you deal with is regulation. So let's move to the second company that you're dealing with, like the scooter company, Cirque, that recently was bought by Bird. There's a lot of regulation around, uh, currently around micro-transportation. We see it in Tel Aviv. How do you set a company giving kind of like the regulatory structure or the anticipated regulatory regime that deals with your business? I don't think, I don't know, you tell me what you think. I don't think we find Europe now to be significantly less regulated than the US. There are still holes, there are still places that need work, but seeing where Europe has simplified, the US has become more complicated, I think it is starting to, to actually converge. Uh, unlike what is sort of historically been the case. Exactly. M maybe just to, to wrap up with this point, is it becoming now easier to innovate in, uh, in Europe or kind of like still the go-to place would be the U.S. when you're starting kind of like a consumer business? It's the U.S. Europe is 4% of global digital market cap and 20% of global economy. It's still clearly the US and China, or maybe China and the US, um, but Europe is catching up. It's about 10% of global startup market cap. So it is, it is starting to catch up, but it's still a very, very long way away. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure talking with you. Wish we Thanks. had more time. Thank, Thank you. you very much.